All right, our next speaker is uh, Pedro Carlos. He is a principal scientist at NVIDIA Research, where he wears two hats. One is ray tracing, he is uh, one of the inventors behind uh, NVIDIA's uh, real time uh, ray tracing system, and um, the other one is on uh, image generation with guns. And today he's going to be talking about his uh, stack based generator. Thanks for the introduction. So, hi, I'm Pedro Carlos. Uh, and I will be talking about our new paper that was accepted yeah. as an oral here mm -hmm. at CDPR. Generative adversarial networks have seen rapid improvements in their result quality ever since their conception. There is a point to speak louder. Okay. <laughs> ever since their um, conception in 2014. Last year, we presented a technique called progressive growing of GANs that enables us to scale up these models to high resolutions in a robust fashion. So we can train, train them with a collection of high quality images, 1K by 1K resolution, in a completely unsupervised fashion. Once trained, we can then run the resulting generator by feeding it a set of random numbers as input called the plane of code to produce a new image that is uh, similar to the ones in the training data, but still completely unique. And of course, we can re-randomize the inputs to uh, generate a big number of these new images. While the results look quite nice, there's one problem, because the generation process is quite difficult to control. If, for example, we want to modify some particular attributes of the image, like gender uh, or hair length, there's no reliable way to do that. One way around the issue is to condition the generator with additional input data. For example, we can associate a class label with each training image, and then at runtime we can specify the desired class in addition to the code to get an image of that class. And of course, we can also do other things like interpolate between classes or even hybrids for interesting results. We can also um, condition with, say, facial landmark locations so that we can then move them around to control the 3D implementation of the image. Or could we go as far as condition on a last image that um, explicitly specifies the position and shape of all parts of the image. And then, of course, at runtime, we can edit the mask and uh, the result image will reflect the edits. But the problem with this, these conditioning based approaches is that they all require a lot of high quality labor training data, which is, of course, quite difficult and expensive to obtain. So the goal in our work was to find out whether it would be possible to get the best of both worlds. We still want to train in a completely unsupervised fashion, but ideally we would like to get a generator with multiple inputs that we can uh, modify independently, so that uh, each input would basically have a clear, well-defined meaning in terms of the image. So, for example, the, the pose and expression here versus the color screen, and we want this separation to be completely automatic. So we approached this problem by designing a new generator architecture inspired by style transfer. The idea in style transfer is that we are given two images and we wish to combine them by taking the artistic style of one and imposing it on top of the content taken from another, like this. So surprisingly, this can be accomplished extremely well with a simple paper architecture presented by Juan and Galoni. The idea is to first analyze each of the images with a pre-trained encoding network in practice VGT19, and then combine the abstract feature representations produced by these networks using, using so-called adaptive instance optimization. What it does is it basically uh, looks at each feature of the content deviation in turn and normalizes the fit according to the minimum standard deviation of the other pixels. Then it computes the same statistics for the style image and scales the feature up to match.
So <coughs> next up, we then did the combined um, feature maps to the corner network that was simply uh, trained to invert what the encoder did and as output we get the design result. Okay, so how do we leverage this design then to um, come up with a new generator? <coughs> well, first of all, we want to be generating images from scratch instead of operating on existing ones. So what we'll do is we'll replace the bottom half of this diagram with the exact same architecture that we used with the progressive GAN. So now, instead of a content image, we have content label code. And we can re-randomize that to basically generate a number of images to, to serve as the content for style transfer. We do the same kind of thing for the style image as well. So we will introduce another um, input latent that we process uh, with a number of fully connected layers. And the point here is that when we random the sound with the second input, uh, these fully connected layers will produce tiles that match whatever was in the training data. So now we actually have a generator with two inputs that we can um, control separately, which kind of was our goal. But why stop here? Because clearly the add-in operation is the magical block that makes this all possible. So why have just one when we can have one for each layer of the network? This architecture works too. It works really well. And what's even more surprising is that if we now look at what the content latent code is doing, it turns out that it doesn't really affect the image at all. So we can simply remove it and replace it with a learned constant. We call the bottom part here the synthesis network. It receives a number of styles as input and uh, then produces the image based on those. And it can be seen as a kind of a styles all the way down design because there's no main input. Everything that appears in the image is controlled exclusively by the styles. The top part is what we call mapping network. The input is a vector of five twelve components. And we'll call the output the intermediate latent, also five twelve components. And in this diagram, we are deriving all the styles from the same intermediate latent. To do that, uh, we introduce a dedicated affine transformation for each added block. So th this is a learned conversion operation that basically extracts the relevant parts of the intermediate latent and maps them to feature map statistics. Going back to our goal, we wanted multiple inputs, but it seems that we, we are now back to one. Not to worry though, uh, because this is just one way to use our generator. Once we have trained it, we can actually mix and match the styles in any way we want. We can run the mapping network several times for different input elements and connect them to different sets of layers. So then we can <coughs> We can randomize uh, these inputs separately and they will end up affecting whatever the generator needed to synthesize on those particular resolutions. So, for example, when we re randomize the input corresponding to coarse spatial resolution, it turns out that that only affects the high level aspects of the image, like gender, hair length. If we randomize the middle layers, that will affect a different set of things. For example, we may come here. And finally, if we randomize five resolutions, <laughs> it turns out that basically we will control the color scheme. So while we have already come a long way to redesign the generator, let's do one more thing. Um, in natural images, there are typically a lot of small details that can be regarded as stochastic, like the hair here. It doesn't really matter where the individual hairs are placed. The overall look just needs to be consistent. So it's more or less random. But it's interesting that we are actually asking the generator to produce this type of random detail, even though it has no capability for producing random numbers. So uh, what we'll do is make the job of the generator slightly easier by providing an explicit, reliable source of randomness. We'll introduce a set of noise inputs, one for each layer, 
these are just single channel uh, images of Gaussian planes. And what we'll do is first broadcast them to cover all the feature maps and then scale them with per feature map load, for instance, and finally simply add them to the intermediate activations. So now this actually provides us one more way to control the resulting image because if we re randomize these noise inputs, we'll basically get infinite number of realizations of the same image. It is really the same image, same person, same expression, and so on, but all of the pixels are completely different. It's all those small irrelevant details that get re randomized every time. Let's look at the result for the next. We evaluate our generator using two data sets, HQ that we introduced in the progressive growth paper. However, the variation in this data set is somewhat limited, so in order to really showcase what our new generator is capable of, we need something better. And thus, we introduce a new data set, LiftQuest HQ, that has more images, but it contains a lot more variation in terms of age, ethnicity, backgrounds, and so on. Also, image quality is higher. So the common way to evaluate GANs is to look at fresh A inception distance, where lower values indicate better image and distribution quality. Our baseline is a progressive GAN, but as our first step, we do a bit of tuning to get an improved baseline. Here we basically uh, just tweak the hyperparameters, replace the up and down sampling layers with slightly better alternatives and switch to the cost function. You can check out the paper for details. So then when we introduce the mapping network at styles, the results are getting consistently better, demonstrating the power of this style-based design. Then when we remove the main input and simplicity network, the interesting thing is that it doesn't really seem to hurt the quality at all. In fact, it even improves it for a survey age here. Finally, introducing the noise inputs also helps, especially with a bigger case H2, because it frees up more of the generator capacity for modeling this high amount of variation. These results were without any kind of style mixing though, so it's interesting to look what, what happens when we start mixing them at uh, test time. So, unfortunately, if we don't do anything special to it, things don't work out so well. The more latent, latent inputs we mix and test time, the worse the results are getting. The reason for this is that during training, uh, the generator never really encountered this case. It was, it was never trained with styles that would be different between layers. Luckily, we can fix the situation by introducing what we call mixing regularization. The idea is simply to do the same kind of mixing during training, so with certain probability we'll generate two legend codes instead of one, and then select a random cut point in the synthesis network where we switch from one, uh, one leg to the other. Um, it doesn't seem to really hurt the training at all, but what's really nice is when at test time we then start mixing styles, the results improve intensely. There's one more interesting aspect about our generator. It actually leads to a considerably less entangled mapping from the nodes <coughs> to images. See why? Consider a simple toy example with two attributes, age and eyeglasses. Obviously, not all of the combinations are going to be equally common. So let's assume, for example, that children with glasses don't exit at, at all in our training data. So the distribution will look like this. Now recall the uh, distinction between input latent and intermediate latent. The space of the input latents is actually quite constrained because they are all drawn from a predefined distribution and the requirement is that any input latent will have to produce a realistic image that matches the training data. So in practice the generator is forced to warp the space in order to make these shapes match, leading to entanglement. However, the intermediate layer space is free from this um, restriction, 
So, in a way, it is allowed to be this kind of outcome. Of course, we need some way to measure whether this is actually the case, so we propose two new metrics. Uh, I will only uh, describe the basic ideas here, so please refer to the paper for details. The first metric, perceptual path rate, is based on the idea that if we consider a linear integration path in the latent space, that will correspond to some kind of path in the original attribute uh, space as well. The more curved this path is, the longer it will be. And this is indicative of the space being warped, so it's going to be entangled. And of course, we are hoping that um, if, if we move the intermediate latent space, it will be much more linear. This diagram also illustrates another interesting aspect about the intermediate latent space, which is that um, we are actually free to also sample outside the data distribution. Here, the training data didn't contain children with glasses, but still, in the intermediate space, there is going to be a region um, covering that combination, and this information pass sometimes passed through there, which is um, perfectly fine. Okay, so the second metric, linear separability, is about finding out how easy it is to distinguish, distinguish the extremes of a given attribute. Consider age, for example. In this original space, there um, young and old people are really easy to distinguish because mm -hmm. the decision pattern is linear. But if the space is warped, then we need a, then it will become non-linear, which is again an indication of the environment. And again, we are hoping that our intermediate space needs to look more linear again. If we look at the results, um, it actually turns to be exactly like this. Our new generator results in a considerably less average representation, and there's also a clear regress between the input and intermediate spaces. Let's look at some example results next. I should point out that all of these images are completely fictional. There's no real people here. They were all produced from scratch by a generator. So this clip is demonstrating style mixing. On the left, we have the coarse, middle, and fine styles, as I described. And on the right, we have the um, result of combining them. So as we can see, the coarse styles are basically controlling things like pose, gender, hair length, eyeglasses. The middle styles are controlling slightly finer details, like ethnicity, for example. The white styles are basically affecting the color palette. Here's another example illustrating the effect of the middle and fine styles. So the columns here correspond to coarse styles that stay fixed, and then we are animating the middle and fine styles over time. And as we can see, the chamber eyeglasses, age, hair length stay unchanged, but otherwise the images are undergoing pretty drastic changes. It's kind of an imaginary family portrait. Style mixing also works surprisingly well with other datasets. Here's Elsa cars and bedrooms. And interestingly, it seems that the coarse styles are effectively controlling the 3D rotation here. Even though the generator doesn't really understand about 3D at all, and it was trained with just a collection of images, the middle and high styles today seem to be to a different basis. Here's an example of the stochastic detail, so we are constantly re-randomizing the inputs. 
we can see the, the effect of the noise by disabling the individual noise inputs um, one by one. If we disable them all, we'll basically get this painfully featureless look. And then if we enable uh, different subsets, we'll see that there's basically this stochastic variation on every scale of the image. And each noise input is responsible for producing the detail in that factor of scale. The results are pretty consistent across different energies. So it's mainly the backgrounds, the hair, the skin pores uh, being minimized. Pretty much everything that doesn't change our perception of what's in the image. Stochastic variation also works with other sets. And I think the really fun, fun thing here is that with cats, the generator deemed the position of their pores to be a stochastic thing. There's no telling where they will be. It doesn't matter. So I don't think uh, it's completely mistaken in that regard. Our implementation and pre-trained networks are available online, so you can go to this URL to find out more. The new dataset at HQ is also available to graphs. This brings me to my final topic, follow-up work made by others. People have been actually extremely eager to try this stuff out with their own data. For example, um, they tried anime faces, classical paintings, fashion, floor plans, buildings, and even Google Street View images. And, and I'm really amazed how, how well it actually seems to work in all of these cases. There, there's a lot of lost more out there as well. And perhaps what's even more interesting is that it took only one week until someone figured out how to solve the intermediate label code that will reproduce any given image. And by now, there are actually multiple competing implementations out there and even one paper. So the ability to provide your own image and then uh, do things like styling, mixing, or arithmetic in the label space um, provides some pretty interesting things you can do, like bring paintings to life, or create crossbreeds of non cubic characters, make people smile, those kind of things. I'm eager, eager to see what, what else people will be able to come up with. So, I think we have time for a couple of questions. And if, we, if you want to chat about this stuff more, uh, our poster will be up on Wednesday. Thank you. this amazing work. I uh, just want to follow up on your last slide where you said you know like you can there are follow up work where you can input a real image and then get the Latin encoding in space, whatever process point. Your thoughts on that? Would is this Latin code space? Would we be able to produce a realistic face from say for example my face? Yes, definitely. So the question was how reliable is this uh, solving of the intermediate layer to reproduce the real image? The, the real game changer here is that um, if we optimize all the different styles together, um, the generator has 18 layers, so we have 18 styles, each with 5 to 12 components. So the whole space is actually really big. And I'm amazed that you can almost get pixel perfect reconstructions of, of you know, your face, yeah, definitely. Or I've been able to project a cat to the latent space of the generator that was actually trained on human faces. And, and then, you know, you can in interpolate from the cat to the person, and that cat still looks reasonable. Thank you. I think uh, in the interest of time, maybe you can ask questions. Uh, 
the end after that point. Thank you.